Okay, everyone. Uh, good evening. I'm Elshan. I welcome everyone here on this uh, short introductory uh, webinar uh, dedicated for two types of taxes. One is value added tax and another is corporate tax. Value added tax is um, more or less um, already, um, you know, uh, common and uh, most of the people know about this and about its application because it's been applied in the East since 2018. And uh, the corporate tax is something new, and it is going to be uh, applied uh, from this year onward. So um, I believe my screen is shared. Uh, everyone can see uh, the slide. So it's actually a PDF document. What I will do is um, I will ask my team to share this with you after the session. And also the, the webinar is uh, being recorded. So we will save it on uh, cloud. And once the webinar is finished, then uh, we'll download the file and then we'll send the link for you to upload to your devices, okay? So let's start with the value added tax in UE. These are the overview, overview what we're gonna cover today. I'll try to be very short and specific and then move on to some uh, hands-on uh, practical experiences. So we'll uh, talk a little bit about um, what is VAT in UE, uh, um, the content and the general principles, VAT registration, compliance requirements, major impacts uh, on uh, businesses. This is, those are going to be the things that we're gonna cover. So let's look at the content. These are basically what uh, was on the first slide. So the overview, general principles, registration, compliance requirements, and the impact mm -hmm. on the companies. So um, what I would like, what I would like um, everyone to do is just to mute because there is some, um, uh, you know, confusion here. My team members um, uh, acting as host, and when they mute, uh, they mute me too. So <laughs> there's technical problems. So I uh, kind of ask everyone to mute their uh, microphones, and if anyone has any kind of question, please uh, just uh, text your question on the chat uh, section. And by the end of the course, um, I will read one by one and try to cover those questions, okay? So please uh, mute everyone uh, independently so that we don't uh, interfere uh, in between. Okay, so what is value added tax in general? Um, it is uh, the tax which is uh, imposed uh, on the final consumer. So um, the value uh, added tax or VAT is imposed by the Federal Tax Authority, which is part of or a division or a branch of uh, the Ministry of Finance. So they sit in the Ministry of Finance. They have their own dedicated website, uh, personnel, and so on. So um, why is actually the VAT is imposed? Uh, because um, the, the world itself, the generally the, the globe, <laughs> is uh, acting almost uh, in parallel with uh, every other big players. So UE is part of um, one globe, and uh, in order to make uh, things uh, transparent, uh, UE uh, accepted uh, the, uh, the the challenge, and um, uh, they agreed together with the Gulf Corporation Council that they will agree in principle to the old GCC VAT agreement uh, in order to uh, levy um, tax. So um, this type of tax is um, applied almost over one, in 150 uh, countries uh, worldwide, uh, very common. And uh, so it was first uh, applied uh, back in mid of uh, last century, like uh, 1950 something in France, and then it was um, applied in many European countries, and then it moved uh, all over the world in order to facilitate uh, the uh, business uh, transa transactions. So um, uh, the VAT, as a general assumption, um, consumption tax, uh, will apply to the uh, majority of transactions of goods and services, uh, of course, unless specifically exempted or um, accepted by the law itself. So generally, um, VAT in uh, UE is um, applied on mainly mainland uh, activities. The uh, free zones uh, basically considered to be like outside of UE. So that's why the operations with uh, free zones, like sales of goods and purchases in free zones are uh, exempt from uh, VAT. 
So when um, inception uh, or start date for the VAT was um, assigned, it was like the 1st January 2018. And since then and onward until uh, today, uh, this tax has been successfully applied. So the uh, common tax rate here in the UAE is 5%. So um, how does it work? How does this VAT um, in general works? Um, so the, in order for any company to um, uh, charge VAT, uh, the company must uh, first register as a VAT uh, business or VAT registered company. And there are, of course, um, many uh, requirements like uh, VAT registration requirements and there is a threshold and so on. So I will talk about this as well. Um, so any VAT registered business must charge and um, add VAT on the value of goods and services that they supply. So the VAT is actually levied um, not only at the last stage when the goods or services are uh, supplied to the end consumer, but it is uh, levied on each stage of the supply chain and collected by businesses on behalf of the government. So basically, uh, VAT is uh, kind of an indirect uh, tax, and it is um, at the end levied on the final uh, consumer. So there is a, a view here. You might um, have uh, attention to that. So say we have here um, a supplier. Uh, we have here factory. We have a wholesaler. We have a retailer. And then there is an individual. So this is the supply chain. Sorry, yes. Um, I was muted and then again uh, unmuted. Okay. So um, here, basically, what we see is uh, that, say, supplier supplies goods uh, to factory in the form of raw materials, and say the raw material uh, amount. Let me um, just a second to zoom this out so that you can see. Maybe someone is joining through mobile app or the mobile phone. Just a second. Um, yes. Okay. Now, um, so let's say that the supplier uh, supplies goods to the factory at a value of 1,000 uh, dirham and 5% of 1,050 uh, dirhams. So the total uh, sales price inclusive VAT is 1,050 uh, dirhams. So what happens is actually, this is the uh, government, say the tax authority where the VAT must be paid. Uh, so the supplier collects this 50 um, above its sales price and then pays it to uh, the government. Then what happens is that uh, the factory um, charges um, uh, sells the, the, the material, but of course, after uh, converting the material into a ready-made product, sells it to the wholesaler and say the sales price at this uh, stage is 2,000 dirham and 5% of 2,000 dirham is going to be uh, 100 dirham. So the difference actually uh, between these two amounts is um, reimbursed or transferred to the government. So basically what must be done the factory must pay this 100 to the government, okay? But uh, because this 50 was already paid uh, on the purchases, the factory is going to just uh, offset this two amounts and pay the difference. Then what happens here, uh, the wholesaler takes the same amount, like 2,000 uh, is going to be wholesaler's cost, and uh, say add uh, a margin of whatever amount and sell it say uh, for 3,000, so 5% of 3,000 is going to be added on it, which is 150, and uh, we'll sell it to the retailer for 3,150. So what happens is actually wholesaler must pay 150 uh, of value added tax to the government, but since on its purchases, the wholesaler actually paid 100 while buying this good from the factory, then this 100 on purchases and 150 on sales, uh, with one is input tax, the other is output tax, they are offset and the wholesaler will only have to pay like one uh will have to pay the difference 50. and the last um, 
stage in this value chain is the retailer when the retailer sells the goods to the individual. So uh, retailers uh, say assigns a sales price of 5,000 and 5% of the 5,000 is 250. So the individual actually pays the total amount of 5,250 dirhams. So uh, the difference that the retailers have to, um, has to pay to the government is the VAT, which uh, the retailer collects 250 and the VAT, which actually the retailer paid while buying the goods from the wholesaler 150. So it means uh, the difference after offsetting these two amounts is 100, which is uh, paid to the government. So what we, we see here is that in total, the uh, individual, which is the end consumer, he's the one who actually is levied uh, the VAT, the 250. But this 250 was uh, gradually collected by the government until the cycle ends. Like um, uh, when the supplier first sold the materials to the factory, the government collected this 50. Then the one factory sold to the wholesaler. Then this uh, difference between 150 and so on and so forth. So this, um, say, supply chain might take around a year, for example. It might take one year. Um, and the government doesn't wait uh, until the year ends and until the individual pays uh, for the goods or services and then collect the money. No, the government collects the value added tax uh, gradually once the goods or services are transferred from uh, one, um, say, player of the chain to the other. Okay. I'll try to later on show this also um, on a double entry bookkeeping um, transactions with debits and credits. Since I asked in the group, like what the level of accounting knowledge uh, in the um, national accounting, uh, and most of the people said that they are uh, either intermediate or advanced, so debits and credits would be uh, very much uh, uh, clear to you. So um, here is the uh, other example where um, uh, it's just shown with um, you know fills. Like for example, if we we look at this uh, that we have. Um, say beans manufacturer, then there's beans distributor, then this coffee shop. So what happens is actually, uh, say here, the, the beans manufacturer sells goods to the uh, beans distributor. Um, the cost for uh, the beans manufacturer say is 10 dirham and 5% is 50 fills. So um, here the net payable to the government is 50 uh, fills. Um, let's assume that VAT on the purchases uh, is zero. So the manufacturer doesn't pay anything on acquisition of its own uh, raw materials uh, because, say, a manufacturer of beans just uh, has a farm and collects the uh, beans from the farm. And there's no any kind of payment for the uh, purchase of the beans. So that's why on the purchase part of the beans, there is uh, zero uh, VAT. But there is net payable VAT to the government. So that's why the sales price here is 10.5. Now, uh, what the beans distributor uh, does, uh, the bean distributor uh, wants to sell it for, say, 15, and this is like 5% of this amount. Um, then the difference between, like, um, this is when the acquisition happened. This is the same payable which uh, the bin distributor paid actually to uh, the, the manufacturer, and um, uh, this is charged on the sales. So the difference of this amount is payable to the government. And the same happens with the coffee shop. So say coffee shop buys uh, the beans from the distributor and uh, sells it for say 20 uh, dirham and one dirham is going to be the sales tax 5%. But on the acquisition of this uh, products, coffee shop paid 75 uh, fills. Uh, so the difference between these two amounts, which is uh, 25 fills will be paid to the government. So what happens is actually, if you collect all of those if you add up all of those uh, value added uh, taxes, like 50 um, fails, then 25, then 25, it makes one uh, dirham. So this is actually the 5% of 20 dirhams um, charged on the sales um, by the coffee shop to the end consumer. So the consumer is actually the one who bears the total um, tax load, not the companies. So that's why the um, value added tax is considered to be as an indirect tax, whereas the corporate tax is considered to be a direct tax because it is uh, levied on the corporation's profits, net profits, whereas the value added tax has nothing to do with the company's profits. 
It is uh, just um, a tax where um, the taxpayers, the individual, say, market players, they are just uh, collecting money on behalf of the government, uh, which is on, on, the, uh, on behalf of the third parties, and then transferring to the government. So we came back to the same first slide in order to see what we actually covered. Like we looked at the overview, uh, general principles, and um, we now will pay attention more on this uh, general principles. So what are the concepts here? The input tax, the output tax, zero rated supply, taxable supplies, reverse charge uh, mechanism, and VAT recovery for exporters. Now we'll look, um, uh, taking into account that this um, session is a short-term session and I need to cover also the, uh, uh, the corporate tax. I'm not going to be going into too much details for all of those uh, sections. Um, there will be like another training, more uh, in-depth training where anyone who wishes to join might join where we will go um, in every single uh, detail. So basically what I will do is I will cover the input tax and the output tax and show how this uh, mechanism would work. So what is input tax? Um, input tax is the um, value added tax which we add on the price of uh, goods or services when we purchase them. And uh, the buyer of the goods, in order to be able to um, you know, offset this amount, must be registered as a VAT uh, payer. Um, otherwise, uh, if we're talking about a buyer who is not registered as a VAT payer or VAT uh, registered uh, business, then any input tax uh, incurred on the purchases will have to be consumed by the business itself. So the business um, not being registered as a VAT taxpayer will not be able to offset it because on the sales part, the, uh, the business uh, is not charging any uh, VAT. So in order to be able to uh, uh, offset this input uh, VAT with the output VAT, the, the primary uh, requirement is that the business must be registered for VAT. And what are the thresholds and so on, we will look at this uh, a bit later. So the buyer can deduct the amount of VAT paid from his or her settlement with the tax uh, authorities. Now, what is uh, output uh, uh, tax or output VAT? Uh, this is the value uh, of the tax which we calculate and charge on our sales of the goods and services. So basically we can um, uh, denominate uh, input tax as a debit and the output tax as credit. So I will show this um, uh, in a while. Zero rated supplies, what are the zero rated supplies? Uh, these are the um, specific types of supplies which are uh, categorized and identified by the uh, FTA uh, that those types of goods and services are uh, zero rated. It doesn't mean that they're exempt, but they are calculated with zero rate. So it's a taxable supply on which value added tax is charged at a zero rate and for which the related input of VAT is deductible. Now, uh, let's look at this uh, taxable uh, supplies. A taxable supply itself at the standard rate is a supply on which VAT is charged at 5% and for which the related input uh, is deductible. So all items which are not coming under both exempted category as well as zero based uh, rated category are coming under standard rated uh, supply. So uh, the value added uh, tax will be due uh, where a taxable supply is being made by a tax person, which means when uh, there is a purchase uh, of the goods and when there is a sale of the goods, this is when the uh, value of the tax is actually uh, levied. So uh, another just path, uh, it was shown actually in our uh, diagram in a circle where we had um, uh, manufacturers, you know, supplying um, materials to uh, producer, from producer to wholesaler and so on and so forth. So say a supplier of the goods or services in the uh, United Arab Emirates for say consideration by any person in the course of the uh, conducting business. So this is the flow when the value of tax is actually calculated. So what is a reverse charge mechanism? I remember there was someone in the group who uh, uh, texted me in, in private asking to explain the reverse charge mechanism. Now, um, the thing is that when you buy goods from uh, outside of, let's say, try, I'm trying to uh, describe it from uh, my own, like uh, with, with uh, simple terms, say you want to buy goods from outside of uh, UE, and um, the seller of uh, the goods outside of the UAE doesn't charge any VAT because the su supplier uh, is not uh, registered in the 
So what happens uh, if the buyer uh, in UE is is a VAT registered business? So in this case, uh, this is when the reverse charge mechanism applies, where the UE uh, company has to um, pay the VAT on the purchases directly to the uh, authorities and then offset it with its uh, uh, output uh, VAT. Okay. So um, in UE VAT, the reverse charge mechanism is applicable while importing goods or services from outside the GCC uh, countries under which the businesses will not have to physically pay VAT at the point of import. Uh, the responsibility of reporting of a VAT transaction is shifted from the seller to the buyer. This is when, of course, the seller is outside of uh, GCC and the seller is not registered. So it means that the seller cannot physically pay VAT. Uh, so who is going to bear this responsibility to pay uh, on behalf of the seller is the registered uh, buyer in VAT. So under reverse charge mechanism, uh, here the buyer reports the input tax as well as the output tax on the sales. So in the same uh, return for the same quarter. As you know, the report must be done uh, each quarter, like uh, by the end of each quarter, during like next 28 days, the company has to uh, report, uh, file the VAT report. And in this VAT report, the, the company uh, should show how much was the uh, uh, input tax on purchases uh, and from the external, uh, say, uh, supplier where we have to use this uh, reverse uh, charge mechanism. So the reverse charge is the amount of VAT one would have to uh, pay on the goods or services if one had bought it in the UE. The importer has to disclose the amount uh, of VAT under both input uh, value tax as well as output. Uh, so the reverse charge means eliminates the obligation for the overseas seller to register for VAT in UAE. And here we have like net result of the reverse uh, charge. So the um, course, local and international suppliers on the same uh, footage. Say, for example, if you have uh, an example here of the transaction between uh, two registered um, uh, companies in VAT, right? So um, say here we have um, uh, a company in UE and um, another company in UE. So what happens is the law firm, for example, declares 500 as uh, tax collected the company declares uh, 500 as input tax paid to the uh, law firm, which is recoverable. So since the UAE here uh, pays, like a company pays, say, 10,000 plus uh, 5%, uh, both are registered in the same uh, you know, authority. So th this company paying this VAT will um, uh, report it as input tax and will recover it. And this one uh, collected it, so this 500 will be this company's um, uh, output tax. Let's look at the other way around where there is like international border and say we have um, uh, like UK company and we have um, say the UE registered company. Um, the UK company uh, is a UK firm um, not registered in UE. And so it means that uh, this company has no any obligation to file any VAT return. Uh, to the government and uh, say the UK company um, offers the legal advice to UAE company and UAE company pays 10,000 uh, dirham or equivalent of uh, GDP, okay? In this case, UK company will not be able to charge any VAT. So what will happen is that this company, the UAE company buying services from outside a supplier has to declare 500 as its input tax. Although on purchases, you did, you the company didn't pay this amount, okay? So the UE company just uh, declared this 500 as an input tax, and uh, then later on, the 500 as another output tax. So this is like a reverse charging. So it means that from one side, because uh, the company is not actually uh, selling the same service and doesn't transfer the service to the other parties, uh, will just show in its own report that um, 500 was paid uh, on the purchases, uh, and the same 500 is deemed as uh, output tax. So it's been just reversed. I hope this is uh, clear. So um, the VAT recovery for um, exporters. Now, there are some, some details. Of course, I don't want to go into too much details for those type of uh, specific uh, conditions. Um, let's look at the uh, VAT registration, which is uh, important. Um, as you know, um, 
the, the there is a threshold of 375,000 uh, dirhams. And um, this uh, threshold is um, calculated on annual turnover. So uh, the, the annual turnover uh, could be calculated in two ways. One is rollover method, which means you look into your current month and your previous 11 month, which means you, you look at any consecutive 12 month period. If during any consecutive 12 month uh, period, you see that you are exceeding this threshold, this uh, 375,000 uh, dirhams, it means that you have to, uh, uh, you must, like there's, a, there's an obligation on you to register for uh, VAT uh, with the uh, Federal uh, Tax Authority. So it was like assigned um, by the end of 2017. Uh, now, since the government law uh, started to be applied from 2018, uh, don't pay attention to those dates. Just uh, bear in mind that this is uh, applicable now since that date. So for example, say um, here uh, we have two options. There is an obligatory registration. It is when you have reached this threshold within the last 12 months. Um, and there is voluntary registration where uh, you have reached like half of this amount. So your annual turnover already reached uh, half of this amount, which is 187,500. And uh, uh, you know that you, during the, the uh, next, uh, say, half of the year, your turnover will reach the same. So you will nevertheless will um, uh, pass this threshold. So it is beneficial for the companies to um, register for VAT if they are actually buying goods with VAT. Because uh, if they are buying goods with VAT and they are not registered as VAT payers, even if their thresholds are not uh, exceeded, it means this VAT amount is consumed by the company itself and the company cannot offset it. And this amount is going to be the cost of the service that uh, the company then uh, has to pay to the clients. And um, this will definitely affect the selling price. So the sales price will go up. So if this uh, uh, company is a, a, a stage, a particular uh, player in one uh, value chain, not, not the very last point, but somewhere in between either the wholesaler or the retailer or wh whatever, uh, any of the suppliers, then this will definitely affect its business. So most probably the, the companies, the startups say, um, will uh, register, uh, can register voluntarily if their annual turnover reaches 187.5. But it, this is voluntary, of course. Okay. So, what it says that uh, if the annual turnover is between this amount, it is optional for the company to be registered under VAT. Uh, further, uh, if it's less than this much, the company needs not uh, to uh, register, need not to register uh, for the VAT. Okay. Now, Again, about this threshold, um, uh, how it's going to be calculated, the total value of supplies made by a taxable person for the month in which uh, the company is applying for VAT registration and the previous 11 months. This is what I've already actually said. So the total value of supplies of the subsequent 30 days on which uh, the company is applying the VAT registration. If any, um, if during any of the above two options, uh, among two options, the turnover is more than 375, the company has to register. So it's a must. Register. Okay. Now, um, what are the documents required uh, for the registration? So, the general uh, business details and specific business details. Okay. So, um, once the registr registration is completed, uh, the tax registration number, PRN, will be issued by the uh, tax authority within 20 days after the registration. So, what are those uh, general business uh, details to be registered? This is your uh, trade license, valid trade license, any other documents uh, accompanying your company registration, memorandum of understanding or article of association, tenancy contracts, authorized signatory documents. If uh, you are not the only owner and you are not the only director, if there are some other people, or if you are holding a company, uh, or if you have a power of attorney or whatever. So valid passport, visa copy, and its ID and bank account details. So these are the uh, details that are uh, general uh, details and specific details will be um, uh, the description of the business activities like what was your business activity like uh, what kind of uh, business you doing in general uh, what were your figures for the last 12 months 
what uh, your projected future turnover figure is going to be, um, how much of the imported and exported uh, value you're going to expect from your um, activities, whether you expect to deal with GCC suppliers or customers, or you're going to deal with uh, external uh, suppliers and customers. So if applicable, of course, any detail of the customers, uh, also the customs authority registration. Now, uh, moving forward, uh, compliance requirements. So um, there's, of course, a, re a requirement for the companies to keep uh, records, um, bookkeeping, uh, to keep all those uh, invoices, uh, the VAT invoices, any VAT return files. Uh, if you have ever any tax audits to keep this in place, you know you need, you need to understand like what are the consequences of not complying with the requirements. Like there are some fines and um, uh, the the reliability the reliability uh, of the company in front of the uh, authority. So um, very important to keep uh, books of records. Um, it could be manual, it could be, of course, um, in a computer uh, file, but the records should be um, understandable, um, very neat, um, logical, so that if there is any uh, audit uh, done, uh, your transactions, your uh, explanations, you know, your books and, and records will all um, can be traced. So to be uh, retained for the next five years, starting from January 2017, uh, if you want to keep any hard copies, um, still have to keep it for the next uh, five years. Now, um, annual accounts, general ledger, purchase ledger. So these are the, all those like accounting uh, records that you have to uh, have in place. Uh, you have to have like VAT account uh, where you classify which ones are your input uh, VATs, which ones your output VATs, how much of VAT payables you have. Maybe you have uh, VAT uh, recoverables or receivables even. So all tax invoices, alternative documents related uh, to the same must be kept uh, in your files, uh, purchase invoices, um, good services used for matters not related to the business, uh, any details of important export uh, operations, uh, payments that you've done so far uh, for your VAT, proof of payments, any VAT returns that you already filed, you have to keep with yourself. And any uh, corrections, if you've done, um, um, seeing that you made any mistake in your files, so all those corrections must also be in place. So um, VAT invoices, all VAT uh, companies should issue VAT invoices uh, within 14 days from the date of supplied goods uh, to the valid tax invoices, and so on and so forth. So it should be like in a written document, which must uh, record um, what kind of supplies were made, what is the sequential number, uh, date of the issue of the invoice, the name, the address, the tax number, description, quantity. So everything related to the operation where the uh, VAT was um, uh, charged uh, must be shown in your VAT uh, invoice. So if there are any kind of errors in your invo uh, uh, VAT invoice, um, for example, uh, you collected a, a higher amount um, or higher than the rate specified, then uh, the, the surplus amount that you have collected must be paid to the government. If uh, it was less than the required rate, then the real actual amount which should be paid uh, must be paid to the government. So if you make a mistake from your own side, you have to bear the, the, the difference. If you collect it somehow, if you charge a higher rate, then you just uh, pass on this higher rate to the uh, government. Now, uh, VAT return uh, filing, submission deadlines, uh, late submissions, errors and return submissions, and invoice level reporting. Now, let's look at this. VAT return is submitted online and only in very, very limited um, cases. Sometimes, uh, if FDA requires you, you uh, might submit it um, on a paper, but um, generally, it is submitted online. Now, the deadline, um, all VAT returns uh, must be submitted within 28 uh, days from the end of the return period. So say, for example, your uh, return period is from January till March, um, whatever the year is, not necessarily 17, then the due date will be the April 28th. So uh, we know that the VAT period is quarter, basically, from January to March, then from um, April to uh, end of May, then June, and so on. So after the quarter ends, the due date is 28th of 
April. So you have to be able to uh, file your return until this uh, date. So uh, if, say, this due date falls um, on a weekend or national holiday, of course, this deadline will be shifted and extended to the next uh, working day. If you submit late, what will happen? Um, of course, it can attract penalties levied by the FDA, and the penalties could be like uh, some administrative penalties, uh, not less than 500 uh, dirham. Of course, it depends on the uh, discretion of the FDA. They might um, not uh, charge any kind of um, uh, you know penalties for late submissions. But still, if you have any uh, return submission, uh, sorry, error in return submissions, where an error has been made on a VAT return submitted within the last five years, for example, you found out that last two years, uh, two years before, there was an error in your uh, report. Uh, you have to uh, disclose this uh, error to FDA within 30 days uh, since the date when the, the error was um, disclosed or found. So uh, taxable persons will be required to report details of value of uh, supplies made in each Emirates uh, on their value uh, that return. So when you report, uh, when you submit the uh, return, if you made sales between the different Emirates, you have to show um, in, in the report itself, there are sections where you put that this much of sales was say to uh, Ras al-Khaima, this much of sales uh, uh, went to Abu Dhabi and so on and so forth. So tax audit, uh, can uh, this happen? Yes, of course. Um, there are no any predetermined dates or some um, say agreed upon uh, periods when this uh, tax audit can run, but FTA, of course, can visit uh, your premises anytime, uh, whenever they want. Um, usually this will uh, happen if there are some uh, indications of uh, some uh, violations or you know tax evasion or tax avoidance. So they are um, there to come and to inspect your records. And of course, to make sure that uh, people are uh, compliant with the tax uh, regulations. So what kind of points do we need to consider in this case? Um, usually done by FTA uh, official uh, officers, like their representatives. Um, the companies will be informed uh, beforehand prior to visiting the, the company premises uh, before five business days. And um, it is done only in the business premises, like they will not come to your private places or your home. They will come to see and check your office. Um, of course, they can, uh, if they want, uh, to close your business up to like, uh, 72 hours if they suspect any kind of tax uh, evasion in order to uh, find out those uh, you know uh, irregularities so they can take request um, any records if they like and can also remove a uh, sample for inquiry purposes so they can take some some paper from uh, your records and, and go back to them their own premises and check there so the business owners will be informed the result within 10 uh, business days after the end of the audit what kind of penalties there are? Um, there are administrative penalties, uh, which would be not less than 500 uh, dirhams. And uh, you need to also note that uh, the penalty, the administrative penalty cannot be more than three times of the amount of the tax uh, for which the penalty was levied. So uh, and the tax evasion penalties, when the FTA finds out that you are uh, avoiding tax, then this amount will be up to five times of the uh, relevant tax at stake. So those are the um, penalty issues. So what kind of administrative penalties and why they're uh, there, why the FTA uh, would uh, penalize you? Those penalties uh, have an intention to just uh, address the compliance. You know, uh, if you are not uh, compliant, so the companies, um, in order to be awakened uh, and, and uh, warned, the FTA does this kind of um, administrative penalty just to encourage compliance. So the FTA has a power to waive and reduce the penalties at the discretion example of the person conducting business fails to keep records uh, properly. So um, here we have some kind of freedom. Uh, the tax evasion penalties for those persons, uh, people who use illegal means to either lower tax or not pay the due tax or to obtain a refund for which he is not entitled under law, then the imposition of a penalty under law does not prevent other penalties being issued under other laws, which means that if a person deliberately provides uh, false information and data, then um, the, the amount of uh, penalties might be um, you know, high enough. So um, 
basically um, what kind of impacts uh, will this have on the business? Um, we need to first of all uh, assess, uh, you know, VAT uh, impact on the company itself, then plan and implement, and there's a post implementation assistance. So uh, we need to understand um, how the, the legislation itself uh, will impact the uh, company uh, if the company is um, like uh, free zone, they're uh, selling outside of UE, uh, they just registered here, so the VAT is not uh, applicable uh, for them. Um, the company must uh, have like steps uh, to implement um, to understand like key compliance and documentation requirements. Uh, have to uh, design the VAT process itself. Um, self uh, do the self VAT training for the personnel. Uh, any open areas uh, should be also logged. So with, of course, I mean if you want to uh, automate the process, you you can of course uh, do this uh, automation through any uh, ready applications, or maybe you can order something specific for your own, um, say, uh, transaction flow. Um, the effectiveness, you have to review also the effective supply chain management, prepare for ongoing timely compliance, and, and so on and so forth, until you um, submit uh, the uh, VAT, uh, say, re return. Uh, well, here are some compliance issues that I will just skip, and uh, let's move on further to Okay, now uh, let me uh, move on to the presentation uh, slide where I want to show the uh, technical sides of the transactions with debits and credits. So basically we understood uh, what the VAT is, what the input taxes and what the output taxes and how much should be paid to the government, what are the uh, you know reverse charge mechanisms and so on. Let me uh, draw um, you know a line here between just to show the supply chain. For example, here we have um, a manufacturer. Here we have, say, uh, say um, wholesaler. Here, uh, what is it? Okay. Um, so manufacturer wholesaler, and we have a retailer, and we have a consumer. So consumers are almost everyone who, say, buys goods and services uh, from anywhere. So let me open here some T-accounts, since most of you uh, said that your, your accounting, financial accounting, uh, knowledge is either intermediate, uh, intermediate knowledge or the advanced, all of this will be easily understood. Let me open several T accounts for every participant in the supply chain, okay? So um, first, first would be uh, say purchases. Uh, let it be sales. Let it be bank or cash and uh, let it be VAT account. Okay. So I will just uh, repeat for the same here, bank and VAT, and the last one, purchases, sales, uh, bank and VAT, okay? So let's assume that this manufacturer buys material, material, at a value of 1,000 dirham, okay, or um, AED. Now, the, the VAT that the manufacturer, say, pays uh, buying from any supplier, say, buying from government, is um, 5%, 5%, so 50. The total amount that the manufacturer must pay is 1,050. Now, this is the bank account where on debit side we have cash with the amount in a balance. So we pay 1,050 dirhams, right? And purchase the goods. So the goods will be debited on our purchase account at a value of 1,000 without, without, of course, recording the VAT on the purchase accounts. Since the manufacturer 
and the wholesaler and the retailer, all of them are registered VAT payers, this 50 on purchases will be debited on the VAT account. So the debit side of the VAT account is considered to be input tax. Okay, just a second, guys. I'm just receiving a note uh, from my team. Okay, okay, now um, you can hear me. I was just told that my screen is not uh, shared uh, properly. Just a second, how, how come that it isn't not shared? Because I shared it. Just a second. Okay. Okay, so it's seen. Uh, that's great. That's great. So let me uh, let me go over again uh, since uh, my screen was not shared. Although it's been shown on my screen that uh, I'm sharing the screen. Uh, anyway, so uh, here I'd like to uh, show the flow between the manufacturers. Okay, let me put the red color between the manufacturers, uh, the uh, wholesaler, okay, uh, the retailer and the consumer okay now here um i um, do the t accounts you all know the t accounts okay debits on the left hand side and credits on the right hand side so each account on this uh, screen um, will have debits and credits debit on the left hand side and credit on the uh, right hand side okay so now um, the first one is purchases account, another is sales. Here we have bank account or cash. Here we have VAT account. And the same is available for all the others. Like wholesaler also has the retail account, uh, sales account, bank account, VAT account, and so on until the consumer. Of course, the consumer is the one who actually bears the whole load of the VAT. And the consumer is not a business and uh, will not have any accounting and will not be able to offset this um, VAT at the end. So let's assume that the manufacturer buys materials, okay? Materials from someone, any supplier, who sells this for um, 1,000, okay? And the 5% of VAT is added, which makes 50. So the total amount paid by the manufacturer is 1,050. So say the bank account has on debit side uh, X amount, whatever the amount is in the balance, the manufacturer pays 1,050 and records the purchases at its cost of 1,000. And the 50 of this part, 50 is recorded on the debit side of our VAT account, which is the input um, VAT, okay? So what we had here, Debit 1000 purchase account, debit 50 VAT account, and credit the bank. Okay, I hope this is clear. Now, let's assume that the manufacturer, um, well, incurs its um, conversion costs, like uh, some labor costs, some overhead, whatever the costs are. We're not going to look at this part and decides to sell this for uh, 2000. So 2000 is going to be sales. Okay. And we'll charge the VAT, we'll charge VAT, uh, say, uh, say, let me, let me put it this way, 5%, which makes 100, okay? So the sales price for the manufacturer will be 2,100, 2,100, okay? Now, what will happen? The manufacturer now sells this to the wholesalers. Now, how much money the manufacturer receives from the wholesaler? 2,100, so 2,100 is debited to our bank, okay? The sales itself is just 2,000, we'll put it into our sales, 2,000 credits, and this 100, we record on the credit side of the VAT account. So this is our output tax, okay? Now, what is obvious here, is that on our VAT account, we have on the credit side a balance of 50. So this is actually VAT payable. So this is the amount that we have to pay to FTA. Now it comes the time 
say we have done this transaction January, uh, February, and March. So this is 1st January. This is uh, 31st of January. This is uh, 29th. This year is 29th. It is uh, 29th. And this is 31st March. So say this operation, the purchase and sales, happened during this quarter. Anywhere, anywhere during this quarter. Our now VET report must be submitted by 28th of April, okay, this year. So this is the amount we have to pay and, and we have to submit the VET report during this period. And this amount would be paid from our bank account and the balance on credit will be just closed. So we have now no payable to the government because we have already uh, paid this uh, from the bank and uh, close the account. Okay, now let's look at the wholesaler. Now what happens to the wholesaler? So the same, the same sales done by the manufacturer to the wholesaler is actually the purchases of the wholesaler, right? So the purchases of wholesaler will be 2000. The bank account also has some X amount in the debit side. So the wholesaler will pay how much? 2100. Okay, now this 100 will be recorded on the debit side of VAT 100. Okay, and say uh, the wholesaler will sell this uh, for 3000. Wholesaler will sell it for 3000 to the retailer and will charge the VAT of 5%. So VAT of 5% is 150, and the total sales. Inclusive VAT will be 3,150. Now, what will happen? 3,150 will come to the bank account of the wholesaler, right? 3,000 will be shown on the credit side of our sales account. And this 150 will be credited to the VAT account, credit side. So this is input, input VAT, debit side, and the credit side is our output VT. So what is the difference? 50 balance on credit side, right? So say this happened, the wholesaler, let's assume that the same timeline, okay? So this is the end of April, okay, 30th of April, um, May, uh, 31st of May, and 30th of June. So say this happened, the sales from the wholesaler to the retailer happened during this period, okay? So the, the tax submission must be by 28th of July, okay? So here, the wholesaler must uh, file the return and pay this amount. This 50. So we pay from our bank, like the wholesaler pays from the bank and closes the liability. So the tax payable is just covered. Okay. Now let's look at the retailer. So the retailer purchased the same uh, product from the wholesaler for the amount of 3,150. So bank balance or debit, whatever amount was with the retailer, retailer pays this 3,150. Purchases will be worth only 3,000. This 150 will be recorded on the debit side of VAT, which is input tax. And say this uh, retailer now sells it for 5,000. Let's assume the, the, the amount to be paid by the uh, consumer is 5,000 AD plus 5%, which is 250. So the total amount is 5,250, okay? Dirhams. Now what happens here? The consumer pays this amount to the retailer, 5,250, right? Sales here is recognized an amount of 5,250 is recorded on the credit side of the VT account. So this is output, okay? 
And now we have here the payable of 100 to the government. Now say the retailer, let me uh, put it this way, the same timeline. So say this is the 1st July, say this is uh, 31st of July, this is um, 31st of August, okay? And this is the 30th of September, okay? So this sales from retailer to co uh, consumer happened during this quarter. Okay, so it was during this quarter when the sales happened. It means the retailer must submit the report by 28th of September, okay? So here, the company must file the return and pay during this period, pay this 100. So pays from here 100 and the table is closed. Now let's look at the whole picture and understand what is the uh, burden here and who bears the burden. Of course, the burden is borne by, oops, I chose the red color. Yeah, I hope it's going to be now red, right, yes. So this 250 is borne by whom? The consumer. Now, if you look at how this amount actually been uh, accumulated and, and uh, collected, 50 was collected on the purchases, right? Then the, the uh, other part, 100 less 50, this 50 was then paid here. So this... 100 has been actually covered here. So the difference of 50 was covered here, okay? And the difference between those two amounts was covered here. So what happens is that this is 50, 50, okay? Then uh, this 50 and this 100. So if you combine all of them, let me choose another color. green color. So if we combine this, this, or just add up, it will equal this 250. So 250 is collected by the government uh, prior this wholesale reaches the um, end consumer. Okay, end consumer. I hope this example uh, clears the uh, picture. Now, there will be a question here. What if what if, say, a company, any company in any value chain, say here, buying those goods from the previous manufacturer uh, is not allowed, is not allowed to offset um, the VAT on purchases, okay? So if it is not allowed, I don't know for what purpose it could be, say, any any goods which were not purchased for uh, business purposes or the goods which are not uh, allowed goods, okay? Just for example purposes, what will happen at the end? This amount on the purchases will then not be offset. It will not be recorded on the VAT account. It will be added on the purchases. So this purchases will be not 2,000, but 2,100. Okay, so the wholesaler itself will consume this 100 of VAT. And here, the debt or the VAT payable will be 150 in total. So 150 should be paid, 150 should be paid. Okay, so here, the wholesaler will not be able to offset this amount if in case, the goods purchased by the wholesaler from the manufacturer are not allowed to be offset. Okay, this is this is it. That's it. So here we finished uh, our um, part with the value added tax. I hope it was clear, and uh, we have here questions before moving to the. Um, let me see if we have any questions before we move to the corporate tax. Now, 
I hope everyone now hears. Uh, fuel tax pay can be adjusted from uh, output sales tax. Well, um, uh, if the fuel is used for the um, company's trucks, um, company's commercial activities, then yes. But if um, but if they are used by um, the person personnel cars, even if those vehicles are um, say uh, purchased by the company, but they are used for the personnel, then then no. It's actually very um, you know arguable point. Okay. Well, I'm asking in case of trader as trader and service provider pay fuel sales on its transportation. Uh, asking in case of trader as trader uh, and service provider pay fuel sales tax on its transportation. Well, I'm not sure. I need to understand the transaction itself. If we're providing some services to a foreign company like management or marketing services in the EU, is there any VT can be charged on that foreign company? If providing some services to a foreign company like management or anyway. Okay, this is actually this uh, reverse charge mechanism which I explained. If you're, um, if uh, you are buying or you are selling, you're providing some services to a foreign company like management or marketing services in the EU. So this foreign company is not in the EU, but you are in the EU, right? Is the NVT can charge on that foreign company? Um, well, uh, any sales to outside, this is like considered to be export, I believe, even if it's a service, this is not charged. Uh, VAT is not charged on exports. So I believe that in this case, this is going to be considered as uh, export. Uh, if the, okay, the same question, let me go down. Okay, yes, right. This is an old story, <laughs> yes, right. Uh, we'll move right now to uh, the corporate tax. Uh, can a new startup option? Yes, uh, of course, you can. If your um, if your like threshold for you know middle of the year has already reached one hundred eighty seven five hundred. Now, can an entity request a TA to change its VT return period, say from February to a quarter? Um, I don't think so. You can change it. I mean, it's uh, like. Whenever your reporting period is basically the reporting period and your financial period is uh, usually mentioned in your um, uh, registration documents, your certificate, you know, trade license. Okay. Okay, people just saying they cannot see the slides. Now we already fixed it. I think now visible, people say now visible. Okay, now yes, I'm I'm studying the corporate tax. Okay, those questions are repeating. I'm confused. Last quarter, the 3rd of September, will report. Yes, I mean, the requirement for reporting is uh, 28 day from the end of your uh, quarter. Yes, the reporting is on the quarter end of, uh, not, not end of the next month after your reporting quarter ends. It's like 28 days. Okay, I think the question's ended. Now, let me move on to um, the... Corporate tax. Sorry. Just a second. Okay, now I'm going to share uh, the corporate tax slide. I hope my slide is now visible. Okay. 
Now, um, corporate tax. Now, corporate tax is basically a profit tax. So it's been decided uh, by the federal decree law number 47 of 2022 and related decisions that the companies are going to uh, be levied with the uh, corporate tax starting from 1st uh, June 2023. So those are the uh, topics that we're going to cover, the background and the scope uh, of the corporate tax, persons and tax base, uh, tax group, qualifying group, tax loss, um, exempt income, and so on and so forth. So the, the material is really huge. And uh, I'm afraid that we won't be able to cover all of those in detail, but still uh, we will have like basic understanding of uh, the uh, topic. And we'll try to do some uh, calculations and uh, show the calculations as well. Now, why uh, UE actually introduced the, the corporate tax? Again, the same uh, reason which was for uh, the value added tax. UE has a commitment uh, for the tax transparency and uh, preventing any uh, type of harmful tax practices. So um, since uh, UE was um, uh, tax-free uh, territory, many international organizations, corporations, and multinational companies, they opened their uh, branches here. And uh, so in order not to be uh, allowing um, on a global scale to, uh, you know, kind of evade those uh, escape taxes um, in order to accelerate the use general development and transformation uh, to achieve the strategic objectives and also uh, to be kind of a global hub for business and investment by bringing um, competitive tax regime. So um, since, you know, 9% of uh, the flat uh, tax rate is considered to be uh, one of the lowest tax rates on a global uh, scale, so you is still considered to be very attractive for international business. So when the dates of implementation of corporate tax is um, going to be? Here, um, let's assume that we have uh, four different um, entities, A, B, C, D. So the, the entities, say A, uh, financial year starts from 1st July and ends 3rd of June. Um, it means the fiscal year or the financial year uh, for the company is going to be the same dates. And basically this date, some, um, um, must probably be shown in your uh, registration documents, like when you first uh, register the company, whether on uh, mainland or, or uh, you know, free zone, your um, financial year and the reporting year to be uh, mentioned there. Uh, so if your financial year is 1st July to 3rd is June, um, then your first file, the corporate tax return file, should be, sub should be submitted by 31st March uh, 2025. So it means um, nine months after your the reporting date. So say if your company uh, chooses the financial year from 1st October to 3rd September, then it means that your filing uh, period or due date is going to be 3rd June 2025. So again, nine months after. Uh, if your reporting date is from 1st January to 31st December, then, um, you know, your reporting date is going to be 30 September 2025. Again, like nine, during nine months, this is the like due date. It means you can, you can provide like, um, and, and say if your end of the year is 31st December, you can submit your corporate uh, tax uh, file on January, the, the month after your financial year ends. But, you know, your due date is 30 September, maximum is 30 September, and so on. Okay, if you're, Year starts first April and thirty first March. Then it is thirty first December uh, of uh, twenty five. Okay. Now, let's look at uh, the structure itself. Um, let's look at the geographic form because we know that in the EU there are several um, um, company formations, uh, several geographies. So we have uh, in the EU the mainland. Basically, this is the territory where um, the main residents are residing and uh, they're selling and buying goods within the main territories of uh, the UE. Then there are free zones. So 
So there are financial free zones and there are some other free zones and there are some offshore uh, companies. So legal forms of the businesses not actually um, uh, relevant for tax exemption. So there is no any kind of tax exemption for the legal formation. Um, even the freelancers, um, those uh, say uh, residents of the com country doing any kind of uh, social media uh, work, if they are bloggers or vloggers and they make business, um, then their business, even unregistered, they will fall under the corporate uh, tax uh, law. So if we talk about sole proprietorship or civil company partnership, any kind of the form of the company, limit liability, shareholding companies, free zone companies, branches, and so on, all of them uh, fall under the uh, corporate tax uh, law and they have to all uh, register as um, taxable persons. So for the taxable persons, we have two types, the juridical persons and the natural persons. Uh, some of them um, like um, might be exempt, some of them taxable. Let's look at this uh, exemption uh, part. So we have a, a ministerial decision number 49, uh, which states the business activities by the natural people who might be residents and non-residents. So they are all subject to corporate tax. So who are the natural persons? When we say natural persons, this uh, means that the, the, the people uh, are not registered as taxpayers. They didn't register any um, company, whether sole proprietorship or uh, LLC or any kind of establishment. So there's no any establishment if we talk about the natural person. Um, there, um earnings the business activities which are not subject to corporate tax uh, only are those that are shown below if those like natural persons are working as employees so their wages basically their salaries they are not taxed any allowances any bonuses any like cash non-cash any kind of uh, remuneration received um, as an employee from the employer um are not taxed they are not like uh, due to uh, report so employees should not report any individual uh, income personal investment income if we talk about uh, the natural persons uh, investment activity in person uh, accounts say not conducted through any license agreement uh, nor considered commercial business in accordance with the commercial transaction law any real estate investment income, say investment activity directly or indirectly, sale, leasing, subleasing, renting of land or these uh, estate, property estate, so on, not conducted or does not require license. So if you get any kind of um, real estate income, those are not also uh, taxable and you do not have to register for the corporate tax. So natural person uh, business activities other than above, which are subject to corporate tax, and annual uh, turnover exceeds 1 million, then uh, corporate tax uh, tax should be chargeable and registration required. So if say someone uh, is residing in UE and he or she makes uh, on a personal level uh, and uh, earning um, uh, not business, um, not, not through the registration of the company, but through some investment income, some uh, you know uh, profit from uh, some different activities, um, if the total amount exceeds like 1 million uh, dirham, then this amount should be uh, taxed and uh, will fall under the corporate tax uh, jurisdiction and the person is required to actually register for the corporate tax. Now, taxable persons. Who are the taxable persons? We have residents and we have non-residents. The residents... Um, could be, again, of several types, like those who incorporate the business in UE, that um, they have uh, some incorporation, some establishment recognized in UE, um, in mainland or the free zone, um, or some of the residents who are incorporated outside of UE, they have like businesses outside of UE, but their owners or their managers are residents of uh, UE and they control and manage the business in UE but the company itself is, say, registered somewhere uh, outside of UE. So we have here natural persons, um, the ones which we talked about um, above, like they are uh, residents of UE, but they didn't register a business. They do some kind of social media um, you know, activities, blogging, blogging, and so on, make some money. So 
so they are considered also uh, natural uh, people and, and fall under residence, and other people determined uh, in a decision. And non-residents, so who are those who are non-residents? They are those uh, people who do not actually uh, have the residency um, in UAE, like they are not those who live in UAE permanently, but they have some kind of establishment here. They have some uh, some links. They have some investments here, so they derive basically uh, income from UAE sources, uh, or they have some kind of nexus in UAE. So the the link it link uh, through someone or some property or some uh, business uh, ownership and so on. So they are called uh, non-residents, but they are again fall under the taxable um, uh, person category. So a branch will be treated as one and the same taxable person. So if some, uh, one, some company has a branch here, it's also considered to be a taxable person. Now let's look at uh, the tax base and non-resident. Um, so when we talk about the non-residents, so any UE sourced income, which are not attributable to the uh, uh, permanent uh, establishment of uh, non-resident, so which is taxed in UE. So it could be any of the below, so derived from resident person, income uh, derived from resident person, derived from another, uh, say, uh, uh, natural, you know, not sorry, non-resident, and any income paid or accrued attributable to, uh, you know, a permanent establishment of that um, non-resident. Any income coming from activity performed in UE, any asset located in UE, capital investment in UE, rights used in UE, service performed in, and so on. So, and of course, uh, non residents have uh, some income maybe attributable to the permanent establishment of non resident. Uh, so, income attributable to Nexus, which is, you know, links uh, of non resident in UE. So what are the takeaways from here? Uh, we need to understand the structure of the um, you know, company itself, location where the company is located, and how and where the business is actually done uh, to see how the corporate tax will impact uh, the business. So here we need to first of all check the financial year, um, followed by, of course, the, uh, as per the legal documents of the company. Uh, check if there's any outside UE entities, uh, business could fall under taxable person. If any additional documentation like resolutions is required uh, to you know, fix the uh, financial year. If you have any uh, foreign branch, uh, check the options uh, which become more beneficial and check for any potential entities uh, to fall under uh, exempted category. So grouping. Um, this actually relates to uh, the holding companies mostly where uh, there could be like a parent company, uh, subsidiary companies, and uh, they are registered as uh, juridical uh, people or residents of UE. They are registered as, um, say, separate taxpayers, but since they, at the end, consolidate their financial statements, the parent company consolidates the um, subsidiary statements and shows like a single uh, statement, then uh, they are allowed to group um, their uh, taxable income and provide one uh, tax return. So this is only uh, subject to meeting all the following conditions. Um, so there should be a special uh, like application uh, submitted in order to request this tax grouping. The first is that um, all those residents should be uh, juridical residents which means uh, we are talking about companies like shareholding companies, we're talking about limited liability companies. So all of them must be juridical residents. The parent company must hold a minimum 95% of the ownership interest or voting rights, um, um, uh, take the uh, part of the uh, prop, uh, share, you know, directly or indirectly uh, through one or maybe several uh, subsidiaries. So neither uh, of the group members which means neither the parent nor the subsidiary uh, should be exempt of qualifying free zones. So if they are like qualifying free zones, then in this case, uh, they cannot uh, you know, constitute a tax group. Uh, they must have the same financial year. So the parent and all subsidiaries uh, must be reporting um, uh, in the same years. And they have to use the same accounting standards uh, in order to prepare the financial uh, statements. So long, only in, in this case, they can require uh, you know, tax group uh, reports. So what is the effect of uh, tax grouping? 
is that uh, in this case, um, the, the group or uh, the companies um, under one roof, they will be reporting as a single tax uh, person. Um, then the, the parent company itself shall comply with all the obligations like uh, corporate tax registration, return filing, and the tax payments. So it's sort of like uh, giving uh, for all of those uh, separate subsidies to pay their taxes, the parent company is going to do it on uh, the behalf of uh, those companies and consolidate the statements of the parent uh, and subsidy um, after the meeting into group transactions. So it means that um, once you prepare the consolidate financial statements, there are some intergroup uh, balances, like one company sells goods to the other uh, group company, and there are some unclosed uh, balances between each other, either in the debit uh, receivables or payables or some uh, uh, unrealized profits in the inventory. So after making all those intergroup adjustments, um, the tax is going to be uh, applied. The parent and subsidiary shall be uh, joint and uh, severally liable for corporate tax payable, can be limited to one or more members of the tax group, uh, subject approval and so on. Tax group member of the tax group shall cease to exist uh, if the approval of the authority uh, is not done or the failure to meet the conditions. It means that once the company has already grouped as a single taxpayer, then after the conditions um, have been you know, uh, not fulfilled, then this uh, group, uh, tax group should, should cease to exist. Or the group or tax group can still exist if uh, the parent can change. Like uh, we, we change the parent, so the owner now becomes not this company, but the other company, but the group itself is still there. In this case, the tax group uh, can uh, continue to exist. So the qualifying group where we talk about um, uh, losses of uh, group members, say we have parent and several subsidiaries and one subsidiary's uh, losses can be offset against uh, profits of another uh, group member. So in order for this to happen, again, we have um, conditions to be met. So maximum up to 75% of the taxable income uh, of the transferee can be reduced and the transfer shall be used to loss to the extent of transfer. So here, every uh, group member must also be uh, juridical persons. So, uh, there must be minimum 75% ownership uh, interest in the uh, company where there is a loss to be transferred uh, directly or indirectly. Um, none of the group members should be exempt of qualifying uh, fee zone persons. Uh, they all must have same financial year and same financial accounting standards must be applied. So let's look at this tax loss relief. Uh, what can be deducted? So tax loss can be offset against the taxable income of subsequent tax period, which means, um, say, you have a loss in this year, but um, you want to um, take this loss to the next uh, accounting period where you expect to have profit so that you can offset, offset it against your future year's profit. So you can do so. There is no any time limitation. There is no any uh, like uh, uh, maximum period. So you can extend this uh, until uh, and unless you cover all of your loss uh, in your future period. But there is um, only an allowance that maximum up to 75% of your taxable income from next period can be uh, used for uh, to offset your uh, tax loss. So uh, no relief when it is uh, not allowed um, before the date of the commencement of corporate tax. So say you had uh, losses before the corporate tax was uh, implemented, it's not applicable, you cannot uh, offset it or you cannot you know, carry forward. Before becoming a taxable person uh, from an asset or activity, the income of which is exempt or not taken into account under the corporate tax law. So um, let's look at this example um, where you can offset your tax losses against uh, tax um, taxable income. Uh, for example, you have, uh, these are your reporting periods, 2024, 25, 26, 27. Say you have um, profit uh, or loss before tax. Okay, so this is the profit loss statement where you have your revenue less all expenses and you come uh, reach the profit before tax and then you, this tax must be delivered. So uh, here, if we have say 275,000 loss uh, of uh, the annual uh, year or financial year, you can actually uh, offset it uh, against future periods income or, or taxable profits only maximum up to 75% of the taxable profit. So next year's 
taxable profit is 100. It means you cannot deduct to uh, 175 from 100. Maximum what you can deduct is 75% of 100, which is 75,000. And only the, the balance, like say, uh, after deducting 275 uh, from 275 to 75, you have 200 and luckily say uh, on 2026, your profit is huge, like 1 million. So you do not have to here calculate like 75% of 1 million because we know that you only have 200 and 75% and of 1 million is 750. So it's quite big uh, difference. So you can uh, offset the whole amount against the profits of uh, 2026. And here your uh, taxable income will drop to uh, 800. Okay, here it's going to be 25, here's going to be 800. And next year, like whatever the amount is, will be your taxable uh, income. So these are the amounts that should be taxed. Okay, now uh, we know, everyone knows definitely that uh, amount of um, the tax uh, taxable profit threshold is 375,000. So any profit falling uh, below this uh, amount is not going to be taxed. So it's going to be like zero uh, tax rate applied uh, on this profits. Here you have like uh, 800,000 uh, less uh, 375, which gives you uh, 400 and, uh, 425 and you multiply by 9%. Uh, let me calculate those. So 425 multiplied by 9%. It gives you 38,250. Uh, so from this amount, you only pay um, 38,250 dirham. Here, uh, on the contrary, the amount uh, does not reach your uh, threshold, which means it is below 375. It means no any tax is uh, uh, chargeable. And here the same, okay? So losses can be uh, carried forward for indefinite uh, periods. Now here we can see how the loss, uh, tax loss can be transferred between the qualifying groups. So say we have here two companies, company A and company B, who are part of the same group uh, where we have say a holding uh, structure where the parent and the subsidiaries. So say we have here revenues, 2 million revenue of company A, 3 million revenue of company B, and say your, um, Deductible expenses, allowable deductible expenses. Here is two million five hundred fifty. Here two million four hundred, and you make your uh, loss here. So it's taxable uh, profit or, or loss um, before setting off. But here in this company, you have uh, sixty or uh, six hundred thousand uh, dollars of profit. Now, how much of this amount can be offset? Um, here, it is only allowed to offset maximum up to seventy five percent of the taxable profit of uh, the um, uh, transferee, okay? So the transferer uh, will transfer only 75% of this amount, which is 450. So you cannot actually transfer the full amount unless, of course, this is higher. Say so if this was 1 million and 75% of 1 million is 750, it means that you can offset the whole amount. But uh, since the amount is 600, 75% of uh, 600 is 450. So you, you cannot uh, offset the whole amount. You just uh, offset this much. And this one is carried forward for the next uh, period. Okay, so you, you will be able to offset this in your next accounting period, either uh, against your own company's profit, or if you still make the loss next year, you can again do the same with the uh, other company in the group uh, for qualifying groups. And here your B companies taxable income is going to be 150. Now, uh, here we are gonna talk about exempt income. Say you as a, um, a company, uh, corporate taxpayer, you have some income, like what type of income will be exempt? Dividends and any other profit distributions received from a juridical person that is a resident person. So say you have an LLC, you do your own business and buying, selling. And at the same time, you have investment in another company, not related company, you have an investment in any X company, which pays dividends. And this X company is a resident in UE. So the dividends paid by that uh, investee where you had to invest it into the shares of the company, 
these dividends are paid out of uh, post-tax profits, which means they have the, the profits earned by that in, investee, where you actually invest money, has already been taxed, uh, and, and the distributed profit is after the, the profit was taxed. So the dividends received by you, uh, although it is shown in your um, accounting profits, it's included in your profit and loss statement, but when you file a tax return, you are... Uh, allowed to exclude this um, amount because this falls under exempt income. So any dividends and other profit distribution received from participating interests in a foreign juridical person. So uh, income of a foreign uh, permanent establishment, this is uh, optional income derived by a non-resident person from operating aircraft or ship and international transportation. And there is uh, any other uh, income from a participating interest, uh, so both for residents and foreign jurisdictions. Um, there are, of course, too much details in this uh, topic. Uh, I will not be able to cover all of them uh, at once. Just giving you some kind of uh, you know, idea in order to understand the uh, general uh, picture. So gen deductions and general rules. Um, uh, you know, Basically, when you prepare the um, corporate tax uh, file, uh, it is done on an electronic uh, basis on the same portal where you actually register for uh, corporate tax. So uh, since uh, until now, we haven't actually seen any uh, reports to be filed because it's just been recently applied and the company is starting their uh, say financial year from uh, 30th uh, June, like from July to 30th June, then, then um, their first reporting will fall to 31st uh, March 2025. So it means next year by uh, 31st March, we will be able to see like all of those uh, things in practice. So these are uh, general guidances on which amounts can be deducted uh, in the tax period in which those expenses were incurred. Uh, first and foremost, all those costs or expenses which you can deduct actually uh, must be Incurred wholly and exclusively for the business, not for private purposes. Okay, say you have your um, home internet bills. You cannot like uh, take your home internet uh, bills and uh, deduct it from your uh, business, um, uh, you know, activity as as an expense. So um, those uh, deductions not to be related to the exempt income. Not capital in nature, which means whatever you are purchasing for the company itself, say you are purchasing uh, an equipment, uh, a vehicle, whatever. You cannot put the whole amount of the purchase into an expense. This will be expensed, uh, deducted through your uh, depreciation uh, chart or tax allowable depreciation, which until now is not very clear. Like uh, FDA didn't disclose what uh, is the rate of depreciation. I believe we will just accept what the company uh, is applying in their all internal accounting um, reports, whether the company applies, applies IFRS or applies uh, general accepted funding principles or whatever the uh, you know, accepted practices. So any other expenditures uh, as may be specified in a decision. So um, here there's a note that if an expenditure is anchored for more than one uh, purpose, so the deduction should be allowed only for identifiable part or proportion of the expenditure related to the business. So say you have purchased um, an equipment uh, or um, any vehicle, right? The vehicle is used both for business and for your uh, private uh, purposes. Now here, um, you need to be uh, logically able to uh, divide the amount into two parts, like how much of this you are using for your business and how much of this you are using for your personal purposes. Now, non-deductible expenses, uh, what you cannot deduct for tax purposes, any donations, grants, or gifts, of course, other than to qualifying public uh, benefit entities, uh, which are registered with the government and the government acknowledges them, uh, any other like uh, you know donations and, and grants, gifts that you give away uh, for some purposes are not allowed to be uh, deducted. Any input tax, input VAT tax, which you actually claim in your input tax um, in the calculations, the topic that we just covered before. Um, if you are claiming it, it means that you are going to offset this input tax against your output tax. So there's no point to uh, you know, claim this as, as a deductible expense. This is only going to be deductible expense 
um, for the corporate tax purposes if your input tax was not recoverable, was not like um, uh, you were not able to recover it due to some restrictions. Of course, bribes or any other you know, illicit payments cannot be deductible. Entertainment expenses, which you are um, doing for your clients, for your shareholders, for your, um, I don't know, whoever the stakeholders are, uh, cannot be deducted um, uh, unless and until 50% uh, maximum. Uh, if we talk about, of course, entertainment expenses related to the employees, then um, the, the full amount can be deducted, um, uh, provided that those entertainment was related with the company uh, kind of activities. For example, you run a, a kind of a meeting, and in the meeting itself, you provide food, meal, and so on and so forth. Um, tax on income imposed on the taxable person outside the state or an income tax, uh, you corporate tax, like if you have any uh, income, uh, like uh, any tax that was already uh, imposed uh, outside of you, this is uh, not going to be like you paid, say, in the United States, and uh, you cannot take this tax which you paid outside of you and, and recognize in your uh, expense uh, list and then use it against your taxable income. Interest uh, expenses um, allowed maximum up to 12 million uh, dirhams. Um, or if they are higher than 12 uh, million dirhams, then your interest um, cannot be uh, beyond 30% of the EBITDA. And you take, of course, whichever is lower, okay? Uh, now, we said dividends and profit distributions. If you pay dividends, uh, you cannot like uh, deduct dividends as expense uh, because dividends must be paid from your retained earnings. Like after you um, accrue uh, your uh, tax expense, and then whatever amount is left after deducting your tax, only this amount should be uh, paid as dividends. So uh, dividends paid even in advance uh, cannot be expensed. And of course, uh, non-deductible would be any penalties, any fines, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, interest on related party loans. Um, we will look at actually this um, arms length transaction where the related party could be either subsidiary or it could be like a close family member, you know, where uh, like two uh, maybe companies which are legally separate, but um, one company is owned by uh, one family member and the company is owned by the other family member, say wife and a husband. So, and in this case, one company lends uh, money to the other and there is interest uh, here. So, I mean, all of those transactions should be on an arm's length uh, transaction. Okay, here what was already said before, that ministerial decision number 126, general interest deduction limitation rule for the purpose of uh, corporate tax law. So net interest expenditure uh, deductible, uh, whichever is higher, okay? Whichever is higher here, like uh, 12 million annually, or 30% of EBITDA, meaning before tax, uh, interest tax depreciation amortization. So uh, interest component considered for the uh, deduction. Now, uh, any type of interest composed on financial assets, liabilities, amounts incurred in connection with raising funds, you know, fees for guarantees, anything like standard finance instruments, uh, finance, non-finance lease, foreign exchange gains, losses, capitalized interest, or whatever interest you might have, as an expense will fall under this uh, category. Entertainment expenses, we talked already about this, um, uh, non-deductible part. So what are the entertainment expenses and what it could include, but not of course limited uh, to meals, accommodation, transportation, admission fees, facilities and equipment used in connection with such entertainment, amusement and or recreation. So 50% um, only. Uh, deductible of the total entertainment cost of any entertainment, amusement, or recreation expenditure incurred during a tax period related to customers, shareholders, suppliers, business partners. So uh, employee-related expenses are not covered. It means it's not mentioned here. So can we claim employee-related expenses? Yes, we can claim the full amount of uh, expenditure which we've done for uh, entertaining our employees. But this entertainment uh, should be like logical should be related to the business in order to promote, uh, in order to uh, kind of motivate them, you know, to work harder, to be more productive. If you do some kind of um, outdoor activities, uh, team building activities, you do some meetings and um, 
offer some you know entertainment during during those activities and meetings. So only uh, in this case, uh, those costs can be uh, deductible. Okay, these are the recap of uh, taxable income deductibles and non deductibles what we covered so far. So um, give you all the uh, other income, see if anything is exempted by dividends, capital gains, interest. Identify the expense leak to exempted tax as uh, it is non deductible. Identify personal expense uh, fully or partially. Create separate account to uh, separate them. You know when you have your personal expenses mixed up with the business, you, you need to be able to separate them. Uh, you know clearly. Have a policy for asset capitalization and account non current uh, transactions and write account interest expenses to be classified between third party lenders and related parties. Entertainment expenses to be classified to the right account. Uh, you have to keep the uh, records, um, the penalties and donations into right account so that you know like which ones are uh, deductible, which ones are non-deductible. Uh, unclaimed input VAT to be accounted along with expenses to claim as expense. Uh, if this like the same VAT which was said, uh, we were not able to recover as input uh, VAT and were, it was recognized as part of uh, the purchases and business expenses paid by the owner to be accounted uh, properly. Now we have here uh, qualifying fee zones. Um, we have uh, very little time left. Let me uh, quickly go over it. And um, so uh, we need to look into the, of course, the adequate substance uh, in the state itself. So um, uh, the, the qualifying fee zone should undertake its core income uh, generating activity in a free zone. So have an adequate assets, employees, operating expenses in a free zone. So must maintain audited financial statements, uh, derives qualifying income as specified in the cabinet decision, satisfies the minimum uh, requirement, complies with arms length uh, principles and uh, uh, tax uh, you know, requirements as also has an elected to be subject to corporate tax. So this uh, qualifying fee zone person if fails to meet any of the conditions at any particular time, shall cease the status for that year and for the next year. So if uh, any of the conditions have not been met as qualifying free zones, then for the next few years, the uh, free zone cannot apply for uh, being qualified a person. So activities can be even outsourced to related parties or third parties in the free zone, uh, of course, with adequate uh, supervision. Qualifying free zone entities that are part of a large multinational group will be subject to, you know, the global uh, minimum tax uh, amount. This is like pillar two. Uh, once it's implemented in UE, like this, when we talk about billions of uh, turnovers. Now, um, if we talk about the, uh, uh, you know, imposition of tax and tax rate, the general uh, tax rate, as we know, um, is nine uh, percent. Like this is like the, the flat tax rate at nine percent, but generally up to three hundred seventy five thousand um, dirhams tax rate is zero. Anything above three hundred seventy five thousand uh, dirham is nine percent. So if we talk about uh, qualifying free zones, the same applies here too. Uh, profits um, below, uh, say this amount, qualifying income is zero. Non qualifying income is nine uh, percent. Let's uh, look at qualifying free zone uh, person itself. So corporate tax on free zone business, qualifying, non-qualifying. Qualifying income is taxed with 0%. Non-qualifying is taxed with uh, 9%. And when we talk about uh, non-qualifying taxed uh, 9%, here again, we have to look into the threshold, of course. Now, the zero rate um, you know, tax rate applied to qualifying income is income from uh, other free zone person ultimate beneficiary recipient except excluded activities, those activities that are mentioned in the uh, decree by the cabinet, income from qualifying activities from uh, mainland outside of EE except excluded, other income subject to the minimum uh, requirement on qualifying revenue it does not exceed 5% of the total revenue or 5 million, whichever is lower. And here revenue from uh, immovable property in free zones, commercial property transactions with non-free zones, transaction with uh, any person, for non-commercial property revenue from uh, domestic permanent establishment and foreign permanent establishment of the qualifying free zone. So what are the qualifying activities um, for the qualifying and non-qualifying uh, say activities based on the cabinet uh, decision uh, and decision of relevant numbers? 
qualifying activities in terms of the goods, manufacturing of goods or materials, processing of goods or materials, distribution of imported goods or materials in or from a designated zone to the seller. If we talk about the service in the other, holding of shares and other securities, ownership management, operation of ships, reinsurance services, uh, fund management services, wealth investment management services, headquarters uh, services uh, to relate parties, and so on. There's a whole bunch of list of the services that are uh, considered to be qualifying activities by the uh, qualifying uh, zone companies. And exclude activities which are non-qualifying uh, revenue transactions with natural people, uh, except to ownership or management of ship uh, fund management services, wealth and investment management, financial and leasing of aircrafts, banking activities, insurance activities, uh, financing and lease activities, except financing to late parties related to aircraft, transactions with uh, other uh, free zone person related to immovable commercial property and other related located uh, other than located in free zone intellectual property, assets, income, and um, ancillary uh, activity to above. Now here we'll talk about qualifying, non-qualifying. Well, thank you, as we said, manufacturing of goods and, uh, or materials. So includes the creation, production, improvement, assembly of products and materials from raw materials or components, processing of goods and materials like uh, preparation, treatment, transformation, or conversion of goods and materials into other form of uh, further commercial industrial use or sale, and the distribution of imported uh, goods and materials in or from designated uh, zone for the seller. So these are, um, you know, critical points. Manufacturing costs in free zone or designated free zone. You have qualifying income for manufacturer uh, services. Say we have a manufactured goods here. You have manufacturing company in the free zone, designated free zone. This is a contractor, also a free zone or the mainland or any foreign uh, company. So um, another examples here, you have like a complicated, uh, say, structure. Um, manufacturing company free zone customer in the mainland of the free zone so there's a sales of goods so qualifying income will be the manufacturing profit so with the company which is manufacturing the free zone uh, the, the free zones um, uh, profits from the manufacturing the sale will be considered as qualifying and uh, this will be taxed with uh, zero uh, rates non-qualifying income sales profits unless the product is distributed from a designated um, uh, zone so say free zone to free zone customers, okay? Here we have manufacturing, free zone, and here the beneficiary is also free zone. So any income or whatever income arises here is considered to be qualifying and the zero tax uh, will be applied here. And here, if we have a customer who is a mainland or a foreign, uh, qualifying income, it comes from manufacturing profit and qualifying income from sales or distribution. All the profits will be, uh, say, qualifying. So where the revenues attributable to the non-qualifying distribution activity exceed the de minimis requirement, like 5 million, manufacturing company would uh, lose its qualifying free zone person status and not uh, be able to benefit from free zone uh, corporate tax regime for a period of five years. Okay. Now, um, what time is it? It is nine o'clock. And we still have a lot of things to cover. What I will do is um, we will try to share the slides with you. I just want to show you uh, some calculations because if I keep on uh, going all of, all through the whole um, you know material, uh, we will not be able to uh, finish this uh, within time set. So what I will do is let me go to show you some um, calculation things. But yes, let me tell something about this um, small business uh, relief. There is a small business relief uh, for the resident taxable person. So if the revenue of the resident uh, taxable person uh, for, during the taxable period um, and the previous tax period does not exceed 3 million uh, dirhams, uh, taxable person meets all other conditions prescribed by the ministry. If the above conditions are uh, satisfied, taxable income is considered as nil, which means if your turnover during the whole tax period does not exceed uh, 3 million, then you can uh, opt to uh, you know, apply for the exemption and your uh, taxable income will be uh, considered zero. So this continues to apply uh, to subsequent tax periods and end before sort of December 2026. So this is like relief, a, a temporary relief. A taxable person shall not be able to elect to apply uh, this relief if their revenue is in any relevant or um, 
previous tax period has exceeded the threshold. The gross amount of income are derived during the tax period as per accounting standards. So you do prepare your own uh, accounts for the last period and for this current period. If you see that in, in any of the, the accounting periods, you haven't exceeded 3 million, then you can, of course, apply uh, for this uh, tax relief. Now, types of related party transactions, uh, I will leave it. Connected parties, um, it's very straightforward, actually, um, where you have uh, kinship, you know, up to the 10th, or four, sorry, fourth uh, degree, like you have grandfather, grandmother, you know, uh, nephews, uncles, and so on. So these are all related uh, parties. So any transactions done between them, uh, they are not prohibited, of course. I mean, the whole globe is doing this, and mostly when you start doing business, you usually start doing business with your own uh, relatives first uh, or your friends. So, because they are the ones who trust you. And uh, the only uh, requirement for the tax purposes is that you observe the arm's length transaction, which means the transfer prices uh, should be um, up to the market prices. So, you cannot like um, overcharge or, or offer something at a lower rate other than the market rates, okay? Okay, uh, these are the examples. Administration, let's talk about the corporate tax administration. All taxpayers uh, will be required to register. There is no any kind of um, exemption for the registration for all those taxpayers that we talked about. Um, you have to register before the filing your first uh, corporate tax return, which means uh, there is no any kind of uh, now deadline uh, although before start of this year, uh, there were some rumors that, you know, we have to be able to finish registration by the end of last year. But then uh, it's been announced that there's no any kind of uh, rush. Uh, people are, or companies are, of course, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, asked to register as soon as possible. Although um, the, the website and the portal sometimes lags, you know, it's uh, stuck and, and sometimes you cannot uh, go further. But, you know, you need to try several times. I personally did it uh, several times. And uh, sometimes when it uh, uh, didn't go through, I received a phone call from the FTA and they just asked uh, if I have any problem because I, I put the note uh, that, you know, the system is down, it doesn't work properly. And they just give me a call back uh, and, and asked if I had still have any problem. So they were very friendly. So to be registered before the first filing, uh, it means, for example, if your financial year starts from 1st July, 2023, uh, uh, and your uh, reporting date is 30th June 2024, this year, your uh, first filing of the corporate tax falls into 31st March 2025. So until like that year, theoretically, you can uh, postpone reg registering. But it's not advised, of course, and you are advised to make it as soon as possible. Uh, no registration threshold. Um, there's no such kind of thing that, you know, let me see if my turnover uh, exceeds uh, uh, 3 million or my profit exceeds 375,000 uh, and only after that I will register. No, this kind of uh, threshold is related for the registration for the uh, VAT purposes. So you are uh, a, you know, uh, not required to register for VAT um, uh, unless and, and until you, you reach 375 uh, revenue threshold. But in the profit tax or the uh, corporate uh, tax, you have to register. Uh, we do not observe any kind of thresholds for registration. So the registration goes electronically through the website of the FDA. Corporate tax returns. Um, so uh, you, you cannot like report two, three uh, uh, times in a year. You have to like submit one return uh, per tax period. So the tax, uh, corporate tax return to be filed within nine months following the end of the tax period. This is what we have actually uh, mentioned before. No any advance uh, corporate tax filing. You cannot say, okay, let me let me file it uh, well in advance before my financial year ends. No, you, you cannot do this. All is done electronically through the FTA's website. So let's have a look at um, you know uh, an example, and this is a template actually prepared based on the decree uh, law provided. Of course, there are some conditions. Uh, when you compile um, uh, for some elements uh, to include in the template and so on. So depending on your business activity, you are uh, able to uh, put your own type of expense and, and revenue. So basically what you do, you first keep records of your own financial uh, statements based on uh, acceptable accounting standards, say IFRS or GAP. So uh, for the corporate tax computation purposes, 
you first calculate your accounting profit, okay, for your financial period. So accounting profit, again, is not your taxable profit. This is a profit which you calculated based on your uh, accepted practice, say IFRS. And this accounting profit, say, uh, is based on the accruals method. And IFRS requires that you only apply accruals method. You cannot apply cash method. Of course, for the small businesses, um, uh, it is like given a choice that the small business for the tax purposes can use uh, cash uh, based on accounting, but it's advised to apply uh, accruals um, accounting basis. So you first get your accounting profit before tax and then make any kind of adjustments, okay? If you have any income included in your accounting profit, say exempt income, dividends, you receive dividends from your investments from other companies, you deduct this. Then you make any kind of other adjustments like expenses, deductions, which are not actually allowed. You're not allowed to uh, deduct them. For example, in your IFRS report, you deducted your donations, grants, gifts, you deducted your, say, fines, penalties, even bribes and, uh, you know, illicit payments. But for the, uh, you know, tax purposes, this kind of uh, items are not deductible. So you have to add them back. Okay. You have to just uh, add them to your uh, accounting profit. So there's a list of uh, those um, additions that you have to do, any other uh, items. Then you have adjusted amount, whether you have uh, now, uh, profit or loss um, afterwards. So you have the intergroup transfers. If you are uh, preparing like a group uh, report, you have intergroup transfers, unrealized gains and losses, any other adjustments you make for those adjustments. Then you have a taxable uh, income. Then uh, tax payable, you multiply by, like, you see if this amount is actually, uh, you know, uh, exceeding your uh, threshold, 375, whatever amount is exceeding, then you uh, calculate your uh, tax out of it, 9%. Any, if you have any withholding tax paid before, uh, you can offset it. Uh, if the withholding tax was uh, paid, uh, you know, uh, while you were uh, operating with some countries outside of EU and where there are uh, double taxation, you know, relief uh, treaty uh, between the countries, then you can, of course, uh, offset this amount. So you deduct your uh, withholding tax from the tax payable, any foreign tax credits allowed, any reliefs, and uh, any business uh, restructuring relief if you have, any tax loss reliefs that you have. And this is your like final balance of uh, tax payable or tax receivable, which means a refund uh, that the tax has to pay you, or this is going to be uh, deducted from your next uh, tax payable. Uh, record keeping and uh, auditing. So uh, the time required to keep your records is uh, eight years in total, like your current year plus your previous seven years. Um, so taxable person, including exempt persons, everyone should keep a record of uh, accounting uh, transactions. So here's a decree of decision number 82 required to prepare and maintain all the branch statements for whom? Who are required uh, to um, to have the, the the audited financial statements? Any taxable person deriving revenue exceeding fifty million um, dirham during the relevant tax period. So, if your income is below, uh, not income, say uh, sales revenue is below fifty million in a uh, reportable uh, period, then you are not required by law, uh, you know, to uh, make your uh, audits or to run official audits on your financial statements. And qualifying free zone persons are also required to, uh, if they are qualifying, if they're like uh, uh, zero rated um, corporate taxpayers, then they are also required to have uh, audited report because they uh, claim that they are, uh, you know, zero rated because they have uh, exempt uh, activities and so on and so forth. Other than uh, in case of the tax group, consolidated uh, UA entities uh, need to prepare and maintain standalone financial statements for the uh, corporate tax purposes. So even if you are a group of companies, but you do not apply for the tax group uh, purposes, and each of your company then must prepare uh, its own financial statements for the uh, corporate tax purposes. Okay. Now, accounting basis, which I've already mentioned, cash basis, um, you know, allowed uh, actually for those who uh, are considered a small business like their revenues will not exceed 3 million 
exception circumstances application submitted to the authority. I mean, you have to apply in order to be uh, eligible for this uh, application. And accounting standards applied should be IFRS and the annual revenue not exceeding 50 million, um, you can apply IFRS for SMEs. Otherwise, if your revenues are exceeding 50 million, it means you, you, you anyway have to uh, kind of, um, you know, do uh, uh, auditing, then in this case, you have to, uh, of course, you know, comply with all those uh, details. Closing balance, so transitional periods, uh, closing balance sheet of uh, 2023 will be open balance sheet uh, for uh, adjustments and um, anti-abuse rules applicable for, uh, these are the details. So these are the things that, uh, you know, anti-abuse uh, rules must be observed. Um, these are the uh, steps to assess the impact and so on. That's it. Um, I'm sorry to be very fast because it's been now over two hours that we started the um, uh, webinar. I hope the information covered was um, uh, interesting and useful. Let me now look at uh, any uh, questions. Uh, we have a question, how arms length principle is working in corporate tax for the sister companies if one of them is not raised in the Well, um, it's a very interesting question. Um, the arms science transaction is actually not uh, something new uh, for the globe. It's been like uh, always applied in the US, in, in, in the Western world, in uh, Europe, everywhere almost. So um, if we're talking about the prices um, of sales and your sales to your say sister company, which is not in UE, the sales price that you charge uh, if it is uh, the same price that you charge your non-sister companies, then this is an uh, arm's length transaction or arm's length price. But uh, if, for example, you sell the same product to um, any other client for, say, 100000 but when it comes to your sister company, you sell for 80000 then this is not arm's length. Of course, uh, here uh, we are talking about voluntary uh, reporting. Uh, we will not have any problem with the uh, tax authorities until and unless they come to audit us. And once they audit us, and if they catch this kind of uh, details, of course, then you will have uh, some problems. Um, yes, we will share this recording. Um, is there any implications of uh, application of deferred tax? Um, well, deferred tax is actually um, only uh, relevant to IFRS reports. Since uh, when we talk about corporate tax, it is um, the, the uh, um, uh, tax report, the IFRS 12, which, is, uh, which covers the deferred tax, uh, will not be uh, shown in the um, tax reports, okay? But this deferred tax asset, deferred tax liability, this will, of course, be shown in your IFRS report. This is, these are basically the deferred uh, tax assets or liabilities from the temporary differences, which actually arise um, between the applications of IFRS and application of the uh, tax rules, okay? Now, any other question? Um, uh, any provisions uh, for bad debts allowed in administrable expenses? Well, yes, of course. Uh, this these topics are not very much um, described in detail in the uh, you know uh, the the documents, but uh, everything should be logical. I mean, if you really have a bad debt, if uh, it's proven by the court that you know your client is bankrupt, that you uh, any, anyhow you can prove that the client is bankrupt, is not paying, and so on, and this amount is like a bad debt, uh, so it is allowed to be uh, deductible. Um, so, is there any revenue threshold for the TC uh, CT uh, threshold? No, there is no any uh, threshold for corporate tax uh, registration uh, and reporting, even if you are not. Uh, your your um, revenues, um, say one million, two million, or whatever. Your profit, for example, is is less than three hundred seventy five. You might think that well, um, I am almost exempt uh, to pay this um, uh, tax because uh, uh, nine percent is only applied uh, over and above uh, the amount exceeding three hundred seventy five, uh, irrespective of whatever your turnover is, whatever your profit is you will have to register for uh, corporate tax and you have to just uh, file the return, just show your report, show that these are my um, revenues, these are my uh, profits, and this is like the amount which I have uh, 
uh, calculated. And if it's less than uh, 375 uh, amount of your profit, less than 375,000, then just apply zero rate and that's it. So someone says, thank you very much. It's very informative. Can you share this file with PDF so that we can? Yes, of course I will share it. Yeah, everyone is asking for sharing. Yeah, I will share it. No worries. Um, what is the other question? What if the foreign company has zero income uh, or no income since its business activities is like no service, marketing services? How will the company file for 9% uh, corporate tax? Um, if the company is a foreign company, but uh, we need to look at whether they are residents or non-residents. Uh, if they are non-residents uh, and their uh, business is a liaison business, if they are, I mean, I need to understand actually the case. So it is better if you send me a separate question um, in, uh, to me directly on, on my WhatsApp uh, number. If you are in the group uh, on WhatsApp, just send me directly and I will try to uh, understand the case. Give me the full case, okay? Who is selling, who is buying, like uh, where the transaction is actually taking place and then I will be able to respond properly. Um, yeah, can loss be carried forward, forward, uh, carried back for TC? Carried back? No, carried forward. We will not be able to carry back. Uh, it's going to be carried forward. If you have a loss uh, this year, you will be able to carry it forward and, and use it against your taxable income in the future. Any other questions that I missed? Uh, let me see. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Let me. Um, okay. Um, I believe I covered all the questions. I don't see any any new question. This second. Oh, there's one question here that. Um, uh, if someone pays uh, salary to the owner, okay. Um, if we're talking about sole proprietorship, if you talk about sole proprietorship, uh, the sole prop proprietor is the owner and the manager and uh, assigns like uh, a salary. Well, if, if generally it is not allowable. It's not allowable to deduct because uh, the sole proprietor is actually looking for the profit. So if we talk about like uh, earning profits, then why, why sole proprietor is actually registered as a, so sole uh, proprietor because uh, he's not actually looking for any salary, he's looking for the profits, okay? But if we talk about limited liability companies where the owner is also a manager and he has uh, uh, an amount of uh, salary, which is logical, which is like within the limits of the accepted uh, uh, practice. So if uh, normally uh, general managers would say get like 30, 50, uh, uh, thousand uh, dirhams a month and for some reason this owner uh, um, expenses around 100,000 a month then this is not considered as uh, as arm's length okay okay so paying to owner salary as any any question I believe this is the same question okay can you please explain cash basis that was mentioned on the cash basis of accounting it means like um, this is like basic uh, principle in accounting where you have a cruise base, basis of uh, accounting and cash basis of accounting. Cash basis uh, applies when you basically recognize your revenue, um, whatever amount of cash you receive. Okay, whether someone ha has paid an advance uh, or someone uh, had to pay you before you, you rendered the service or sold the goods like many months ago, but you had the receivable and you didn't receive the amount, but you received it after four, five, six months. So whenever you receive cash, you are recognized as a revenue, okay? Whenever you pay cash, you recognize the revenue. This is, uh, no, sorry, you recognize an expense. So uh, this is cash basis. A cool basis, irrespective of uh, when you receive cash, when you pay cash, um, you recognize your revenues. When your goods or services are delivered, rendered, you recognize your expenses when you actually incur those um, expenses, not when you pay for those expenses. This is basically the difference between cash um, and accrual basis. Um, okay, uh, here, here, here there's a request to open, <laughs> open the WhatsApp group for uh, questions. Well, I will try to do this, but I, I know that there are a lot of people uh, and um, the questions might be repeating and I might miss uh, questions. There will be some chaos. I, I'm afraid that there will be some chaos. So it is better if someone has a question, a specific question, I mean, um, you can uh, send it to me 
And if I, for example, see that this kind of questions are repeating uh, the same answers, I will just share those questions with the ready answers in the group, okay? Uh, so thank you very much for, um, thank you so much for holding the session. It was very informative. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. Thank you very much for joining. And I know that this is too late now. You uh, spent your time, valuable time. Um, it was my pleasure to um, run this uh, seminar. We'll try to run similar seminars on different topics, um, on finance related topics. And in the uh, you know, Google uh, form that I shared before, uh, you saw different uh, topics related to finance, say, uh, budgeting, you know, profit, uh, profit planning, uh, some finance for non-financial manager training. These are the trainings that I personally will run, and uh, some other uh, trainers will also do some uh, free training as well on different topics such as lead management, uh, some uh, blockchain, digital uh, transformation, big data, and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you very much, and um, have a good night. Take care of yourself. Bye bye.